So we are on to the last assignment of the semester that I will be grading. And that is to show you the last kind of major art technique, which is digital painting. So we're going to go to unit 14. We just finished our presentations. Uh, in our presentations, we had lots of good examples, especially today, of digital painting artists. And you can go back to that discussion anytime and look through people's slides for reminders. In fact, I might even do that because I really liked one of Skylar's images. So remember that these presentations are here for you, as well as your midterm presentations that you do with your group. But Skylar's artist, artist, Gen Z, which is a hilarious name. It's a perfect name. There it is. In doing concept art and art direction for video games, you know, I really was taken by this one where influences like Gustav Klimt and Alphonse Mucha, their, their Art Nouveau artist, uh, German and French, to incorporate some of that color palette, some of those flat shapes kind of layered into the dimensional painting, the use of turquoise versus gold. So if there's any kind of art that just really inspires you, you can use this as inspiration for your digital painting. Just like if you were painting at home, you might have a board next to your table or your easel where you put different photos of things you like, right? So art historical or contemporary. That's the reason we do our presentations before this last project. So if we go to unit 14, digital painting is basically controlling every pixel in a raster program usually using a tablet and a pressure-sensitive stylus, like we have, and just maybe starting with a sketch, maybe just starting with shapes and rendering them up. We're also going to have question of the day four as part of this unit, and we're going to start talking a little bit about the role of AI and how that might help the process, right? Uh, but also some of the challenges it, it puts into art in terms of its validity and who made it. Now, AI is very, very good at photorealistic stuff. And we've been kind of introduced to it in little ways through the semester, right from the beginning with portrait AI for our avatars as an option. But they have problems because they work off of large data sets and they reflect the bias that's in those data sets. So for instance, if you use portrait AI and you put in your own photo, no matter who you are, no matter what gender, no matter what skin color, no matter what hair, uh, if you do it as an iterative process where you take the process, the, the sample they give you and then run it through the process again, it turns everyone into a flawless white woman in just three steps, right? So this is me as a flawless white woman. And that's just one way of, of the, the bias kind of taking over. When it's the, the generative text-based, you know, stable diffusion models like DALI, which is kind of the, the most well-known of this, or mid-journey, it will often struggle and have biases as well, especially for things like hands or uh, the direction of faces, uh, because if you think of all the two-dimensional images of our 3D world, that's a bias towards just all the two-dimensional images being worthwhile. And sometimes they're seeing hands from different angles, so I have different articles about that. But it can be very helpful, in my mind, at giving you reference images to use. So if I'm trying to design a golden owl with red mechanical eyes, I might put that into one of these and get ideas that inspire my work. What I don't think is great is to just say, okay, I'll take this and that's what I pitch. Because then I have no way of knowing how that was made or how I could reproduce it in a way that makes it usable to a client. But if I'm going to start a digital painting of it, or a vector design, or a logo, or a 3D model, you know, this can help me have some ideas of where to start, right? Because it's really hard to start from nothing. So here's a, a little AI program I haven't showed you called Crayon, which is just a pretty simple stable diffusion one. 
And I might put in, I want to put a tuxedo cat licking itself. Because that's going to be my subject matter for my next assignment. And it's just going to survey all of its training data and then pixel by pixel build something that thinks it's what I'm looking for, you know, of a tuxedo cat licking itself. Notice I didn't put in the style of anything, so it's most likely going to be photo based, like photorealistic, because that's what the, the, dominance, the dominant images online are. So it might take a while. <laughs> I haven't used this one in a little bit. So we'll check back on it. Now, generative tools are also built into the programs we've been learning. So in the new versions 2024 of Photoshop and Illustrator, they have text-based generative tools right in them. And so I took my first assignment from this semester, assignment one, which was all composited, right? And I just, what's called outpainted it, grew its edges. And it did an okay job. I like some of the extensions that it did. And this is curated and chosen. But it does some things better than other things, right? So before you use it, you still want to know all the skills that go into compositing and making it your own. All right, so this is what it gave me. So it gave me lots of tuxedo cats. And they all look fairly photorealistic. And they're all... Are they licking themselves? Well, they all have their mouth open. <laughs> and then they've got like multiple tongues. It gets kind of horrific, right? But what's kind of nice is you can see, I like crayon just because it's really basic, it's free, but you can see uh, other prompts that people have put in that they think matches, right? A fat black and white cat laughing because millions and millions of people are using these things every day. And it kind of shows you just the average of what people are interested in when they're looking for this kind of image. So how do you do a better job with AI for reference for yourself? Because none of these inspire me to make a digital painting, right? But if I do a tuxedo cat licking itself, and I want it as a drawing, well, we'll do a, yeah, we'll do a drawing. Well, no, we'll do a painting, though often they're synonymous in terms of AI because it's what databases they search. And in the style of is a very helpful phrase. And I want to use Gustav Klimt and Alphonse Mucha. And I want it to be... So it sounds like some people are playing with it. <laughs> so, so... Yep. So let's see. Now, there are some really good, like, French Art Nouveau lithograph posters of cats, you know, so maybe that will help a little bit. But it seldom does what you want it to do, right? This is just kind of a shot in the dark. It's a lot like doing a Google image search and seeing what you get. But this way, you're getting images that no one has seen before. So it's kind of fun to pull reference from that. So I'll check back on it. And then there are artists that take the AI to an extreme level. And this is one of my favorite pieces I've seen. I saw it over the last holiday break, so almost a year ago. This is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And this is an artist, Rafik Enadol, who has whole programming teams that work on their AI software. And so this is an artwork that's you know playing all during museum hours and is actually reacting to the number of bodies that are in the museum at the time and it's reacting to the way they're they're sp spread throughout the space of the museum there's all these sensors that feed the the image data and then it it shows a visualizer of it now this is the the one that's most artistic and this is everyone's favorite always and sometimes it will get extreme so when it's busy this is a lot more explosive and colorful and this is a pretty chill time at the museum. But when it's really exciting, there's like a whole crowd of people around it because the museum's already full. And these are interesting tools. You know, so here is, here's a different example. And so you have the computer generating this image based on data in real time. 
and it's it's elevated to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which is kind of where the very best contemporary art world art of of the world goes. So AI is somewhat validated, you know, as an art tool. It's just how do you use it in a way that's useful. So these are a lot more interesting, right? Because Gustav Klimt and Alphonse Mucha, and I see more of Mucha in these than Klimt, though this one has a nice mix of both. But that, that's a much smaller set of images, right, than all of the tuxedo cats and, and licking images all life. So it hurts my cat. I don't see the tuxedo cat anymore. But I get some really, really interesting understandings of the color palettes, the compositions. Uh, Muka and Klimt both have very organic compositions, being Art Nouveau. And so maybe some of these can influence me. I really like these colors. So what I'll do is I'll just simply save this image. And I'll use it like this as one of my inspiration images, right? For the digital painting I, I might do. And then, again, what I like about crayon is it shows me other people that have done similar things. People love their cats, right? So here's, here's a Gustav Klimt kind of cat. And so on and so forth. All right, so maybe that's useful to you. Let's see, where was I? And now this question of the day, it's going to get you to think a little bit more deeply about this. Because digital art is a community of artists, and many of them try to make their living off of making art in a digital realm, which can already be easily copied because digital art can make you can make perfect copies so now this is just a reflection more broadly on what kind of difficulties being a digital artist gives you with selling your art and feeling like your art is validated right some artists will give certificates of authenticity you know a lot of artists will will hand sign and limit do limited editions of their work but that's something that traditional media doesn't usually have to deal with so think of synthetic media, think of authenticity, authorship, mass production, these kind of issues. And that will help you with this last question of the day. Again, to get credit for it, you just want to answer with 100 words or more. All right, that brings us to digital painting. The limits for it, just because this is an introduction, is you can do a portrait from the shoulders up, like I did Admiral Nelson here, or you can do an animal full body. And we're just going to do it on a blank white background. You can always fill in the background later. I've used this to do just kind of schlocky commissions sometimes. But digital painting is not my favorite, like, limited way of working. But it can be a fun way to practice. There's a little pet portrait I did for a friend of their corgi. I like it when students will use it as a way to explore their own personal aesthetics with a self-portrait kind of combining their photo reference with some of their, their favorite colors and not being too precious with it. I made this rhino as an example, turned it into a, a Christmas card. I then painted in a little wreath around the, the rhino's horn because in the wrinkles it says happy holidays. So there's a lot you can do with digital painting because you control every you can control every pixel. Let me activate that. So, there are tons of videos online, we saw some of them in your presentations, that show how artists will do it, and they tend towards photorealism, right? Sometimes really airbrushed and clean, sometimes a little bit more brushy. This was the one that was just included in today's presentation by Raiden, and it starts with kind of a pencil sketch, though it's all done digital, but it's mimicking a pencil sketch and then block in base color, a lot like flatting and digital coloring, except notice that the line art isn't really clean, it's just a guideline. And then you paint within that base color and just layer it up. They would use multiply mode a lot with your different tones and shadows. But what you'll notice 